Hi guys, just wanted to do a quick presentation on the science of memory for you in case you were not in class um, the last several uh, lectures. So memory like learning or perception or motivation or personality or anything else we've talked about or will talk about this semester uh, can be thought of as a process, an evolved biologically based process that uh, works <clears throat> with our environment works with our culture. Now, what I want to do is talk about the science of memory today. So some of the things you've heard about memory, some of the strategies, some of the reasons why memory fails uh, are not actually accurate. The science of memory tells us, for instance, that reciting something over and over is not enough. It's not sufficient to ensure that we actually remember it long term. A good illustration of that comes from this demonstration with a penny. Now, it's probable that you've seen an actual penny before. In fact, the average person your age has probably seen a penny around a thousand times. But would you believe that when asked which of the following, A through L, is an example of an actual penny, most people do very poor at this task. In fact, they are no better than guessing. The correct answer, by the way, is A. Now, isn't this interesting? Despite the fact that we've seen pennies thousands, perhaps, times in our lifetime, it's very difficult for us to pick one out in a lineup. That's because even though we've experienced a penny before, it doesn't necessarily mean that we've encoded a term we're going to talk about shortly encoded that penny in a meaningful enough way so that it can be stored and retrieved accurately at a point later in the future. Do you guys remember um, Dory from Finding Nemo? Remember Dory's problem? It's okay if you're having trouble remembering because that's exactly what Dory's problem was. Dory had an issue allegedly with short-term memory. If you don't know the story of Nemo and Dory, go back and watch. It's an excellent animated film. But in this film, Dory has trouble with memory. According to Dory, she has short-term memory problems. And you see this play out in the film because despite the fact that Dory just met someone a few seconds earlier, she will have already forgotten that interaction. Now, what's important is that this is not actually an illustration of short-term memory problem. Your short-term memory, or working memory as scientists sometimes call it, is actually only supposed to last for 20 to 60 seconds. It turns out that if you're having trouble remembering something for more than 20 to 60 seconds, it indicates some other type of problem. Perhaps, to use that term we just mentioned, an encoding problem, or maybe a storage problem into a more long-term storage facility, like long-term memory. More on that later. I said memory is an evolved biological process that works with our environment to help shape who we are, to help shape our understanding of where we've come, and believe it or not, help shape who we're going to be in the future. Memory, by definition, consists of four things. Encoding, consolidating, storing, and retrieving. Encoding is just a fancy way of saying that before memories can be stored somewhere in the brain, they need to be tagged. They need to be marked. They need to be... Uh, <clears throat> identified in some meaningful way. Now, to use a metaphor for this, think about a post-it note. A post-it note that you write on and then place strategically in a location so that you can't help but read that postage note at a later date. For instance, if you want to remember to go to the dentist, perhaps you put the date 
that you're supposed to go to the dentist and the time on a post-it note, and you stick that right on your bathroom mirror above your toothbrush. Uh, this is a sort of encoding, an actual physical encoding. But most of the encoding we're going to talk about in this chapter, and most of the encoding talked about um, in your book, is about encoding that happens inside your nervous system, right? It's a special neurological process by which your experiences get marked in a neurological way, right? After those experiences are tagged or marked in some meaningful way, they have to be packaged, right? They have to be put together in a way that gets them ready for storage. Consolidation or consolidating refers to this packaging process, this neurological packaging of your memories or of your experiences, as it were, getting them prepared biologically for storage in the brain. And of course, storage is pretty straightforward. Everyone understands what storage is. It's a place you put things while you're not using them or while you're not consciously attending to them so that you can pull them back out, hopefully, in the future and use them at a later date. Now, obviously, storage occurs in your brain. Two fundamental things to remember about storage is that some memories are stored in the cerebellum and some memories are stored throughout the cerebral cortex. More on that later. And finally, retrieving memory, downloading memory, bringing memories back into consciousness, right? Retrieving information in the future is about taking information out of storage, bringing it back into your conscious awareness and using that information to make decisions about your life. Excuse me. For instance, <clears throat> If you look at the squares, they are all different sizes. This is meant to indicate that according to Atkinson and Schifrin's research, sensory memory holds a lot of information. This is a series of networks in your brain thought to be associated with a particular stage of memory called sensory memory right? The sounds, the sights, the smells, all this information that comes through your sensory system, that's bombarding your nervous system in a form, in a, in a, in, as a, as an input enters your sensory register or your sensory memory. Now, while a lot of information can actually go into the storage facility, not nearly as much, much information can move into the next storage facility, short-term memory, also called working memory. Short-term memory does not hold nearly as much information at any given time as sensory memory. Short-term memory then can be preserved in one of two ways, either through rehearsal, which merely keeps the information in short-term memory. It kind of guarantees that the information that you are currently working, working with stays in short-term memory. Or it gets uploaded more directly into a longer-term storage facility known as long-term memory. The boxes, again, are different sizes because they indicate how much information you can store in these three respective storage facilities at any given time. Now, what you notice is that you can also lose through a decaying process, a declining process, um, information at all three of these stages. Obviously, you can lose information in sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Now, how does this decaying, declining, or what we might call forgetting process work? Well, <clears throat> in sensory memory, most of the forgetting is the result of the fact 
that sensory memories only last about a half second to two seconds. So despite the fact that you can get a lot of sensory information in here at one time, it doesn't stay in for very long. It literally decays, disappears. The way you send some of this information from sensory memory into a more long-term type of storage, into another storage facility, is to pay attention to it. Attention is the bridge that gets information from sensory memory into short-term memory. Now, short-term memory, granted, has a smaller capacity, as you see here, indicated by the smaller box. However, what short-term memory has um, an advantage in is that information stays in here without you doing anything to it. It stays in here for 20 to 60 seconds. That may not seem like a long time, but that is much longer than the one half to two seconds that sensory memories remain. So again, let's assume that you've got some information in short-term memory. It's going to stay there 20 to 60 seconds if you do nothing with it. But I've already said earlier that there's two things you can do. You can rehearse it so that you can keep the information in short-term memory another 20 to 60 seconds, or you can upload it more directly into long-term memory for longer-term storage. Let's take a look at both of these processes. Let's imagine that you've got um, some information that you're studying for an upcoming test and you want to remember that. Well, if you simply read that information, recite it, write it over and over, just tell yourself that information over and over, you can keep that information into short-term memory for 20 to 60 more seconds. And then of course, before those 20 to 60 more seconds are up, you can read it again and keep it in another 20 to 60 seconds. Now, none of us would want that deal. None of us would want to work that hard just to ensure that the information we were trying to learn and remember stayed in short-term memory for another 20 to 60 seconds. We would want or we would hope that our studying would pay off a little bit better than that. We would want to study in some way so as to upload that information, right? Or offload that information into a facility that is much, much stronger, much better about holding on to the information for a much longer period of time. So in this case, we wouldn't use regular rehearsal or what, what the book calls rote rehearsal, what you guys might know as memorization. We'd want to use a fancier, more active, more personally meaningful type of rehearsal. We'd want to use what your book refers to as elaborate rehearsal. Elaborate rehearsal is when you actually do something more, do something emotional, do something personal, do something meaningful with the information that you're studying. Now, there's a lot of different things you can do in the spirit of elaborate rehearsal, but one of the simplest things you can do is to use a process pioneered by a Harvard psychologist around the 1950s or 60s named George Miller. George Miller and his magic number seven researched short-term or working memory. Now, you heard me refer to short-term memory as working memory a little earlier. Um, I want to put short-term memory to work now to demonstrate what I meant. Imagine, if you will, that you are given a series of numbers. One, eight, zero, four, six, four, six, four, seven, seven, four. And just as quickly as you hear or see those numbers, they disappear on the screen or disappear from the screen. Now your task, and this is what Miller's original research demonstrated, is to recall, retrieve, bring back as many of those numbers as you can in the same order that they were presented to you. Most people, Miller found, were able to remember about seven of those numbers 
plus or minus two. So the majority of people in his original research could remember right at seven. Um, fewer people could remember about five and fewer people could remember about nine. So at the high end, some people remembered about nine of those original numbers. At the low end, about five people remembered those original numbers. Uh, excuse me. At the low end, uh, people remembered about five of those original numbers. And the majority of people remembered around seven. So this is where we get Miller's magic number seven. Miller said that each of these numbers, unless these numbers mean something to you, are considered a chunk. Excuse me. Considered a bit. One is a bit, eight is a bit, zero is a bit, four, six, and so on and so forth. He said that when you're trying to remember all of these individual numbers as individual bits, there's far too many of them for your working memory to remember. However, he said there is a way, there is a way to improve your working memory. He said the way to do that is to organize the information that you are working with by chunking it. Here's an example of a chunk, according to Miller. We take the same 11 numbers and we separate them into different chunks. In this scenario, your numbers are now 1, 804 in parentheses, 646 by itself, a hyphen, and then 4774. Obviously, you recognize this as a phone number. Clearly, this is more meaningful. The chunking has helped create a type of organization or a meaning. Let's try another. A string of letters, if you can imagine. You're asked to read those letters or someone reads those letters to you. And then almost as quickly as the letters were read, they are removed. The question becomes, how many of those can the average person remember? Well, since those letters likely mean nothing to you initially, the average person is going to remember about seven of those original numbers or letters. Some people will remember five. Some people will remember as high as nine. But likely nobody will remember all of these letters. Unless, of course, they were taught to do something elaborate, to do something more meaningful with them. Unless they were taught to do what George Miller researched, that is, chunk. In this case, I'll tell you that these letters represent schools in Virginia. Do you recognize them? George Mason University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and so on. In this scenario, as was the case in the first with the numbers, by turning the string of letters into four different chunks that represent colleges and universities in Virginia, it makes it easier for the brain to hold on to all of the letters. You notice that short-term memory's capacity has not changed. You still only have seven plus or minus two bits worth of capacity. Information is still only going to remain in there for 20 to 60 seconds. But by chunking, organizing all of these bits into meaningful categories, you're more likely to remember all of it. Again, to review, George Miller is famous for his research into short-term or what we now call working memory. He found that the average person could recall about seven plus or minus two bits, and a bit is just a meaningful unit of information. He said through a process called chunking or organizing those bits, the way we do zip codes, addresses, and phone numbers, we could stack information into short-term memory in a way that allows us to hold on to more bits. Think about stacking Pringles versus putting checks mixed together. That's kind of a good illustration. 
Now, earlier I said that short-term memory lasts about 20 to 60 seconds and that you could do two fundamental things while information is in your short-term or working memory. You could merely read or recite, as it were, the information over and over to ensure that you keep that information in your short-term memory for another 20 to 60 seconds. This is called rote rehearsal or maintenance rehearsal or memorization. The key is here that no value is being added. It is meaningless. You're doing the same thing with the information over and over. You're merely doing with that information over and over. The other choice is to rehearse the information in a more elaborate way, which refers to it being meaningful. Here, the most fundamental thing you can do is what George Miller called chunking. You can organize the information. But you can also form associations with the information by connecting it or attempting to connect this information with something you already know. You can also um, try to form deeper relationships with the information by uh, bringing emotion to it. Or you can merely do something completely different with the information, like create a song, draw a picture uh, that correlates with that information, uh, talk about that information with someone who may or may not be interested. In other words, teach that information. Lots of different elaborate techniques that you can use in order to ensure that you get that information from short term into long term memory. Again, long term memory is a much more permanent stage of storage according to the Atkinson Schiffer model, but it's not completely um, permanent. You can see here from my schematic that you can and do forget information. That information does decay, that information does degrade, that information can be lost from long-term memory. And what I want to do is talk about how that happens, because that's not very intuitive, I'm sure. To understand how memory can be lost or decline or decay out of long-term memory, you have to realize that <clears throat> when you are uploading information into long-term memory, that is only one part of the process. Each and every time you reflect upon, each and every time you think about or bring back a memory, you are going into long-term memory and downloading it back into short-term. Another reason we refer to short-term as our working memory. You see, we don't actually think about, we don't actually do things with our memory while they're in long-term. We have to download them back into our working memory in order to do something conscious with the memory. Now, here is where the first source, the first fundamental source of disruption occurs. You see, <clears throat> memory, even though it's largely a biological process, is in fact, is in fact um, affected by what's going on in the environment around you. Therefore, if you are remembering something that happened yesterday, perhaps you saw a car accident, perhaps that car accident made it on the news, you will download your memory of the accident into short-term memory. And if you're also watching the news that next day, you have no choice but to potentially be affected in some way by the news report. It's possible that some of the information from that news report gets consolidated or bundled up with your memory. And so then when you put it back into long-term memory, your memory has changed ever so slightly. That's one way in which Long-term memories can change or get distorted or get lost, as it were. Now, another way happens when <clears throat> you're putting information into long-term memory to begin with, and the information that you're putting into long-term memory 
conflicts with stuff you already have in long-term memory. Again, to use the example of the accident. Maybe you saw the accident occur such that it appeared as though a police car caused the accident. But when you try to put that memory into long-term memory, you don't have anything in long-term memory that matches that. Maybe you've never even considered that police can cause accidents. Maybe all of the long-term memories you have, all of the storage bins that you have, all of the tags that you've ever used in long-term memory tell you that police don't make mistakes, that police don't do anything wrong, that police therefore could never cause an accident. So even though you're remembering it correctly, when you put it into long-term memory, it can get changed because quite frankly, it doesn't jive, it doesn't coalesce with what you already have in long-term memory. You have to make it fit. And the way you can make it fit is to either change the information that's going into long-term memory to fit the categories you already have in long-term memory, or change the categories you have in long-term memory to accommodate for the new information. If you take developmental psychology, you'll learn more about this process or these processes. They're referred to as accommodation and assimilation.